Open your Bibles, please. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible this morning, so if you have a software app or a Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, I don't know if the name Larry Walters is familiar to any of you. I read an account of his life several years back, and he, was, he lived in Long Beach, California, and he had always wanted to fly. It was his great desire to get up into the sky and experience all that flying allows. Well, Larry Walters didn't know how to fly, but he did know how to sit in a lawn chair. So one morning he decided to buckle himself in to get a whole bunch of helium balloons and attach them to the lawn chair. He gathered up some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, a little bit of water, a CB radio, and then most importantly, he took a BB gun with him because he thought, I'm gonna float up into the sky. His plan was to go maybe 30 feet up into the air and just kind of hover over his neighborhood. And if when he wanted to come down, he would just shoot the helium balloons. Well, little did Larry Walters know that he had too many balloons. And instead of going 30 feet in the air, he went three miles up right into the flight corridor of Long Beach International Airport. So with all kinds of jets buzzing around him, he realized, I'm in serious trouble. So he started shooting the helium balloons. And miraculously, he landed safely right in the arms of the Long Beach Police Department. And when they asked Larry Walters, what in the world were you thinking? He simply answered this. He said, you can't just sit there, can you? Well, I've thought about Larry Walters, especially as we begin our study this morning, because there's a lot of people that, that are like Larry Walters. I like his attitude. I like his drive and initiative to accomplish his dreams. But as I look around in our culture, there's a lot of people, a lot of people like Larry Walters who don't like their lives who are looking for some kind of a grand experience that somehow would bring meaning and purpose. Too many people that just hate their jobs, hate their life, hate their families, hate everything, especially in this pandemic. Just as such a struggle with the fatigue and the isolation and the feelings of loss and helplessness and is it gonna get better, is it not? And a lot of people are wondering about the meaning of life. Well. I think from Larry Walter's experience, we can be pretty sure doing something crazy doesn't automatically bring purpose and fulfillment. It sure didn't for him. Uh, after his experience in the sky, uh, Larry Walters became a bit of a celebrity. And he ended up on, on The Tonight Show at that time with Johnny Carson. He ended up with David Letterman on, on The Letterman Show. And uh, he enjoyed that aspect of it, but nothing else worked out in his life. And since his, really his life goal was accomplished by flying, he didn't have anything to live for. And tragically, he decided the best thing to do was to take his own life. And so he committed suicide. And he's just one very, very, very sad illustration of the principle that you can't find meaning of life by some kind of external experience. It has to come with some sense of internal purpose in life. Flying in a, a lawn chair, running with the bulls, making lots of money, whatever you want to put externally there, a heart-pounding thrill ride, isn't going to bring ultimate purpose. Something else does that. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 tells us what it is. So let's take a look at it together so we don't miss out like Larry Walters did. We're going to read in verses six, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 17 through verse 19. Here's what the scriptures say. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, 
storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. It's that last phrase that struck me, taking hold of real life, eternal life, that which is truly life. You see, the, the whole key, the whole key to finding what life is really all about is lining ourselves up with God's mission right now. It's setting our sights on His purposes and not our own, His goals and not our own, His plan and not our own. He has a mission of reaching the world with the gospel. We have to line ourselves up with that. He has a goal of exalting His Son. That's what we have to do, exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has a plan of restoring his rule over creation. And it starts with you and me and us coming to that place where we say, Lord, we want you genuinely to be Lord over our lives. And we want to line ourselves up with your purpose and your goals and your plans. And having a divine goal changes everything. And so our time together is going to be lining ourselves up with God's mission, both as individuals and as a church. And, and I think that's the reason for this series that Pastor Assad and Dan have been emphasizing, investing in the future. This divine mission begins to take shape in our hearts and our minds as we learn the scriptures and we give our hearts fully to the Lord. It's a mission that thus far we've learned it's worth sacrificing for from luke chapter 8 like the women did who supported jesus ministry it's a it's a mission that's worth being generous with uh, the story of zacchaeus in luke chapter 19 explains it well and it's a, it's a mission that can take not only individual meaning but corporate meaning as pastor dan shared last week out of second corinthians chapter 8 well, during our time together here in our passage now, we're going to learn the principles for actually funding God's mission, both for us as individuals, but especially for the Orchard Community Church. Because God doesn't want us missing out on his mission. He doesn't want us missing out on that which is life indeed. And he wants us to know it's surely not going to come from the stuff of this world. I mean, Jesus said it so plainly, Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And so I'd ask you, did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? That line up every aspect of your life, personally and corporately as a church, with accomplishing God's mission in this world, especially in your finances. That's the way that you and I and we together can take hold of that which is life indeed. And in verses 17 through 19, we're going to get four very straightforward biblical principles on how to do this. Now, my heart's prayer is that you'll be reminded, as I have been in my preparation, that, that, that my life matters because it's connected to God's mission. That's where life really, really starts to take on an eternal significant meaning. So let's dig into our text now and find our, our principles. Notice the very beginning in verse 17 that Paul's instructions are for those who are rich in this present world. I don't know if you would describe yourself as rich or not. From, from a biblical perspective, if we have more than the essentials, that of food and that of clothing and that of covering, if we have some discretionary income, we would be considered rich from a biblical mindset. And most of us have discretionary dollars, so we'd fall into that category. And if that's the case, then these principles really start to make sense. Notice first, we are instructed to focus our hope on God's proven faithfulness. Verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited. So, so the apostle here is telling Timothy, there are some dangers to avoid that are associated with, with having wealth. And one of them is the 
is the conceit or the arrogance, as the NIV translates it, of being rich. Uh, the original word that's translated conceited, it, it means literally to think above. And some rich people feel superior to those who are poor. They have an attitude that looks down on those who don't have as much as they do. And that's why throughout the scriptures, riches and arrogance are often put closely together. Proverbs 18, 23, the poor man utters supplications, but the rich man answers roughly. Rich people don't tend to cower in front of others, begging for help because they don't need it. A poor person has to do that. But a rich person, by his very nature of having lots of resources, can be gruff or rough in this text in their attitude towards others. And Paul just says, don't do that. If you've been blessed with riches, don't do that. Verse 17, don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. It's so easy when you, when you have some extra resources in the bank to think, ah, I'm okay. I, I can handle anything that comes my way. Well, and then something big hits, like the pandemic, unemployment, insecurities, all the uncertainties that hit us, and we begin to realize riches, they are not the thing to trust in. And the, and the scriptures make mention of that numerous times. Proverbs 23, verse four, do not weary yourselves to gain wealth, cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it's gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heaven. You know, Paul's point is really pretty clear. It's very, very easy to replace God with gold. And the apostle is going to instruct Timothy to teach you and me and us together, don't do it. Don't replace him. Don't fix your hope on on the meaning of life to be found in money. Instead, verse 17, fix your hope on God. He provides so much more security than any earthly investment ever can. Focus on Him. That's the point of this. When we line ourselves up with His heart and His mission, that's when we begin to experience life indeed. That's the call, that's the challenge. And I hope that you'll consider it. Is your hope on God? Is that where you're focused in on? It's a good place for us to pause and reflect for just a bit. The mission of God becomes our primary purpose in life. We fix our hearts and our minds, our whole value system on Him. That's what really brings meaning. But I want you to understand that as we set our hearts on the Lord, doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to enjoy his blessings. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Paul tells Timothy to teach us. Enjoy God's financial blessings, verse 17. Fix your hope on God, notice, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So if you've been blessed with riches, don't ever feel guilty about it. Just be thankful that God has chosen to pour out his gifts upon your life. And the scriptures repeat this, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. So enjoy God's blessings. Just recognize there isn't one good thing in your life, my life, and our lives together as a church that hasn't come directly from the merciful and loving heart of our Father in heaven. James chapter 1, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So whatever good things you have going on in your life right now, just recognize God the Father gave them to you. And he provides all of those provisions. He supplies us so that we can enjoy them. So enjoy, enjoy the blessing of God. The thing that he doesn't want us to do in that enjoyment is to simply hoard those resources. We're to make sure that our hearts are fixed. We're secondly, to enjoy his blessings, but thirdly, we're to invest in God's divine 
mission. And that's where Paul goes with these instructions. Verse 18, there's four of them. Instruct them to do good. In other words, use your money to accomplish something noble, something excellent. Do some good with the blessings God has entrusted to you. How? Verse 18, to be rich in good works. We're to supply our own family's needs, but then help others who are in need. You say, Dennis, how much am I supposed to give? I have no idea. All I can tell you, according to verse 18, is that I'm just supposed to instruct you to be generous. See it there? The word etymologically, that has a word, compound word, simply translates to give well above. And that's what a generous person does. That's what is expected, to give well above what others expect us to do. And it, interestingly, it's one of the reasons why God made us rich. 2 Corinthians 9.11, you'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. So he blesses us with his riches so we can be generous, so that we can invest. Verse 18, we need to be ready and willing to share. If I had to sum it all up, it would simply be this. God gave us his blessings so that we can be a river of blessings to others and not just a reservoir of blessing for ourselves. He wants those blessings to flow through us and not simply be hoarded by us. And so I would simply ask you, are you investing in the mission of God? You say, Dennis, times are tough right now. Of course they are. COVID has, has been a wreck to many uh, people's economies. Uh, we, we have people who, who struggle with fixed income, who struggle with school debt, who struggle with, with uh, health care needs and costs. Lots of struggling. We're trying to help our kids. We're trying to help our, can, our, our grandkids. How do we give when we're stretched so thin? Well, it's a big topic and I can't tell you everything to do. But all I know is this. You go and ask God what he wants you to do with his riches. And the principle is simply he wants us to be a river of blessing and not just a reservoir. Having that divine mission really changes everything for us. It, it helps us understand clearly that our hope is in God. It helps us enjoy the many blessings he's given. It allows us then to invest in that mission. And by doing so, Paul concludes now, it prepares us for eternal rewards. The scriptures are really, really clear. If we help fund the advancement of God's mission right now, verse 19, we are storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. We lay up a treasure. Whatever we invest right now, we'll receive back as a dividend in the coming age, as the NIV translates it. The Bible is absolutely clear. Each one of us is, given an, is going to give an account before the Lord Jesus Christ on how we use the things he supplied us with. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And if we manage then his provision wisely, according to his principles, we'll be storing up a good treasure up there, a firm foundation that will already be poured when we build our house upon it, when the Lord builds our house upon it to be with him for all eternity. It'll just be there waiting for us. And this is why Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Here's the principle, beloved. Just, just remember this. We all know that you can't take it with you but the scriptures are clear, you can send it ahead. Investing in the mission of God. May I ask you just straightforwardly, are you investing at Orchard Community Church? If this assembly has been a blessing to you, it's advancing the kingdom mission of God. Here in Escondido, uh, by their investment in missionaries, you're, you're extending the mission of God to the corners of, of the globe. 
You're, you're helping to feed the hungry, helping the homeless. Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about a legacy gift of leaving something for the Orchard Community Church. But this whole idea of investing in the future becomes very, very practical for the blessing of God right here in Escondido. And if OCC has ministered to you, then keep investing in it. And if you do, you will take hold of that which is life indeed. We'll experience the life that God wants us to live as we look at it through the lens of God's word and then trust that following him and following his principles that he's given us will lead us to the real and true meaning of life. Let me conclude our time together by telling you just one quick story. Uh, there was a man who was wandering in the desert. He had uh, a vehicle that broke down and he was out in the hot sun all alone, had no provisions and knew that he was going to die of thirst. And as he walked along the road, he noticed off in the distance a shack. And so he walked over there, almost got there, but then collapsed and had to crawl the last 20 yards into the end of the shack. There he found a, a water pump coming out of the ground from a well. And, and he crawled up on that pump and he started pumping, but nothing came out, nothing whatsoever. And he was completely heartbroken until he saw a jug over in the corner that had a note on it. And he walked over to the, to the jug and he picked it up and he read the note. And it said, this jug is filled with water. Do not drink it. Use it instead to prime the pump. And I promise you, you'll have all the water that you'll need. And so the man faced a decision. Would he follow the directions or would he allow his own desires to consume him and just take the water and gulp it down? He decided to trust the note. And he went over and he poured the water down the, the pump itself to prime it. And then he began pumping. Nothing happened until it started to squeak. And as he kept pumping, his heart got more and more encouraged as a drop of water came out, then another. And pretty soon it became a, a, a steady flow of water that he took and drank and consumed and it satisfied his needs. He took and filled up the jug, put it back over in the corner and scribbled an additional note. This really works, trust me. Well, in many ways, that's a story of what God is saying to you, to me, and to us. We know that we have principles from God's word, and the question is whether we're gonna trust them. Do we consume all of those resources for ourselves, or do we invest them in a divine mission? We have to trust the Lord, take a step of faith, and commit to investing in the future by funding God's divine mission. I hope you will. So you think about this, and whatever God tells you to do, you do. We thank you, our Father, for giving us your word, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would use it to encourage my sisters and brothers in Christ, and that together we would line ourselves up with what you have planned, with your goals, with your purposes. Our hope is fixed on you, and we trust you, Lord. So. Speak to our hearts about what to give, how to give it, when to keep it, when to use it, and all the complexities of our emotions that go into the finances. Please, Lord, we want our hope to be fixed on you. So speak to us and show us how to do this at Orchard Community Church. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.